the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 789 for Monday, November 18th, 2019. Uh, Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab the show where we take all kinds of questions, all kinds of tips, all kinds of cool stuff found and mash it together with the goal being that each of us learns at least five new things. Every time we get together, we're talking today about, well, we've got searching Safari's history, running Mac OS Catalina on unsupported Macs. Yeah, we've got some good tips, previews in the finders file list. Uh... And a creative use for Chrome profiles, too, that I am looking forward to. Sponsors for this episode include Mac.Cashfly.com, MacWeldon.com, where MGG gets you 20% off your first order, and NativeDeodorant.com, where MGG also gets you 20% off your first purchase. We will talk more about those details shortly. But for now, here, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in increasingly chilly Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yeah. Hey, John F. Braun. I was in uh, I was in increasingly chilly Nashville this weekend for the first time. I'd never been there before. We went down to uh, check out schools for my son, who's a senior in high school. So looking at colleges and such. Um, but they got to experience Nashville, which was actually kind of fun. I, uh, it reminds me a lot of Austin, especially Austin, like 20 years ago. Uh, but with more live music than Austin, it feels like Austin calls itself the live music capital of the world. And much as I love Austin, I'm not sure that that title sticks, but it, I mean, I still love Austin, but Nashville really Kind of blew me away. Fun little town, easy to get in and out of. It's a short plane ride, less than three hours from uh, from Boston, so even closer for people that are closer. But uh, yeah, it was cold there. But it's cold everywhere, or it has been cold everywhere in the country. I guess it's warming up in the places where it's not supposed to be have been that cold. But uh, now, where yeah. did you say ten- Tennessee? You were Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you go to a uh, Graceland? Well, that's in Memphis. Which is about three, right. two hour drive maybe from Nashville. I have, I have driven, I have been at Graceland before, not inside, but, um, but I have, I've driven through Memphis before and so have seen Graceland from the outside. Um, but, but no, we did, we did not. We did, we did go to the Country Music Hall of Fame, which was actually amazing. Uh, some really interesting things there. Uh, more of a, you know, American Music Hall of Fame, I would say. But, um, but yeah. It was cool. It's fun. Toward Vanderbilt and, uh, you know, all those fun things that, that you do. Fun city. Highly recommend it. If you ever get a chance to go there, go. It's good. Oh, yeah. okay. What's yeah. your, uh, what's your kiddo looking to uh, study there? Um, math slash computer science is, <sighs> is what choice. interests him. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, or maybe engineering worked for me. Uh, um, eh. He may study engineering, but but with more of a math focus than an engineering focus, I think is where like the, where the computer science and it's and and math problems meet. That's where his interests are. So, yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, no, I've known a few folks here, and yeah, actually, um, having a computer background and a financial background, especially if you're near Wall Street, isn't a bad idea. Right. Yeah. No, he's, he's looking to become a, an attorney. Um, I don't know what type possibly patent law, those sorts of things, but, um, but. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's fun. I've, I've worked with, uh, yeah. And it's funny that they're very much like engineers and that we're both into process and. Yep. Well, most patent lawyers. Detailed analysis of problems and, you know. Like we do here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 No, at first I'm like, oh, he's a lawyer, you know, what, what a terrible thing. And <laughs> well, some not, lawyers not are terrible. all lawyers are terrible, but but there there are a group of them. That but get patent attorneys are, are people that think very much like engineers. And actually, the one I knew actually did take some engineering training. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time so, to be a patent attorney, you need some sort of technical background. Otherwise, they won't let you in the club. So, yeah, it's well, good. 
Hey, uh, you, uh, I want you to tell us about, the, there's two tips that you've got queued up here. One about wallet and one about Safari. The first thing that I want to do before we do that, though, is I want to tell everybody about Cashfly, our first sponsor today, because in addition, of course, to providing all the bandwidth that gets the show from us to you, Cashfly has this great web optimization engine that you can use for your business. And and even a patent attorney could use it, you know, and, and that would still be OK, because Hey, we all need our websites to move as fast as possible for each second a page takes to load. It costs 16 percent in engagement. And of course, fewer visits means fewer customers. So Cashfly's new flexible edge platform goes far beyond just delivering the content. They provide powerful APIs for solving your content distribution problems. They do on the fly next gen image optimization for you. Load balancing of your application, smart asset delivery, you know, like they do with our podcasts for you. If your website is tied directly to your revenue and you know it is optimize your site's content now and Cashfly, because you're a Mac Geek Gab listener, are going to provide you a free optimization consultation free just for you go to mac.cashfly.com that's m-a-c.c-a-c-h-e-f-l-y.com and learn how cashfly's web optimization solution can help you and your website's lighthouse score now mac.cashfly.com our thanks to cashfly for sponsoring this episode john take it away i will so I think the first thing we have here is from Dan. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my process meter and mail is taking 100% plus. So I don't know why. I always quit but, mail when we do this show because of exactly <laughs> that. No, seriously. Yeah, because you never know when it's going to decide. Now's a really good time to index. It's like, well, maybe, maybe, or maybe not. Yeah, I think I'm going to quit it. Yeah. yeah. That'll help. Do you want me to read Dan's yeah. thing or do you have that? Oh, no, no, we're good. Okay, yeah, cool. I got it. So, uh, so Dan wrote in and this is good stuff. And Dan says, hey, guys, many times I find myself looking through the titles of my web history on Mac OS for a web page I know I've recently visited. This, of course, isn't easy, especially when the title of the page isn't indicative of the content you're looking for. Well, I just realized that I could use Spotlight to search the history. Also, after I did that, I realized I can also go to the history slash or whatever symbol you want to use show all history in safari and there is a search although i prefer the spotlight method since it gives a preview of the page also curious i tried this in ios i don't think the spotlight method works hard to tell but i think it's just doing a web search but if you tap the bookmark button at the bottom of the screen in safari then tap the clock icon history button and pull down on the content you can get a search there too Huh. Pretty obvious. Well, no, I don't think so. It's obvious. I Everything's obvious when you know what to do. Yeah. Ah. Wow. I like that. That's pretty good. I never thought about. I, yeah. It. Of course, it's obvious now that he mentions it. But that's the beauty of quick tips. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Great stuff. Uh, What's the next one you got, Mr. Braun? Uh, I, I, I got it all, man. All right. Um, well, here we got a, a something from a, I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing here because I think, yeah, there's there's some extraneous stuff here. But anyways, John, Dave and Pete. Hi, Pete. <laughs> Maybe this is something everyone already knows. And I just discovered it tonight out of need. But I found a way to quickly clean out my old passes in the wallet app on iPhone. I travel a lot and have accumulated several old flight tickets and events in wallet that I didn't stay on top of deleting. At first, I started deleting them one by one, and the task quickly became tedious. I figured there had to be a better way and then discovered the Edit Passes button. If you scroll to the very bottom of the wallet app, this will allow you to quickly delete the unwanted passes. And he's right in that you can choose multiple passes if, if you go to that screen. Otherwise, you do them one by one, and who wants to do that? Uh, oh, especially if you have multiple passes for the same event. Oh, it'll just go. Huh. Yeah, like airline passes and stuff like you and I have both done this. Uh, you know, I, I get my airline passes uh, in there. Of course. And, uh, 
Huh. So that's a good one that there's a, yeah. So, so you could going to that screen, the edit screen, and it's a, you know, when you see it, it's pretty familiar, but um, you can choose to delete all your passes if you want to, though. I don't think you do because there's some you want there. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> yeah. That's handy. Oh yeah. I just got rid of my, uh, my passes for, we saw a Vanderbilt football game on Saturday because we figured while we're there. And so I just deleted those and I deleted my Southwest flights. Wait. So your ticket for your football game, they, they offered a pass for that? Oh, oh yeah. Cool. Ticketmaster. Most. In fact, I also de- deleted the ticket for the oh, was ticket master. Okay. little feet. Yeah. 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 Most. Well, and then I had a show that I saw in Portsmouth uh, a couple of weeks ago that I also had not yet deleted. That was an Eventbrite thing. And those passes were also in there. So, yeah. Handy stuff. Handy stuff. You know what else is handy? I uh, I follow the Apple support Twitter account and occasionally they have actually more than occasionally. They have something that's super handy. And in iOS 13. As you are closing your uh, tabs in Safari the first time, if you close multiple tabs, it'll pop up and say, hey, do you want me to automatically close your tabs after, say, a week or a month or something like that? And regardless of what you answer there, you will never be asked that question again, but you can get yourself back there. And this uh, tweet from at Apple support explains exactly how you go into settings, you go to Safari and there is a it's I don't know, maybe halfway down in the list in the tabs section, there is a close tabs option and you can set it to manually after one day, one week or one month. And so I have mine set to one month. It turns out, uh, I don't know. I might change that to after one week because on my phone, I tend to let things build up and I don't use it as bookmarks. Like I know some people save tabs and they don't want them to ever change. Well, then you would leave it in manually and then you'd be fine just like it used to be. But, um, but yeah, so there you go. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. I think I, I sent that in to feedback ah. at beckygab.com. I was wondering how that got in there on the list. And it turns out that was from you from feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I like it. And you heard them right, folks. If you want to send us pretty much anything, cookies. Yeah. Well, you probably can't. Well, electronic cookies you could send us. Maybe. I don't know. But it's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I like it. I like it. All right, John, you're uh, you're killing it with these tips here, including that one that I thought I had put in here. But it turns out, nope, all these tips have been from Mr. Braun or, or from listeners that Mr. Braun. Uh, called yeah, I just it. sent it in because, yeah, so I follow the same. Which is, is it Apple support yeah. is the uh, Twitter at, feed? At okay. Apple support. Yep. So, uh, so follow that and they'll give you handy little tips like that. But um, that will take us to anyways. Robert. Yeah, so Robert has a good one here. He verified something that we suspected was true, but I don't think you or I had necessarily verified it, Dave. But he said, I just verified the following works using Parallels version 15 running on a Catalina supported Mac. Create a Catalina virtual machine. Okay, step one. Then number two, copy the virtual machine file to the unsupported Mac running Mac OS High Sierra. On the unsupported Mac, um, I'm sorry. No, that's right. On the unsupported Mac, running Mac OS High Sierra. On the unsupported Mac, run Parallels and then run a Catalina virtual machine. Expand it to full screen and it almost feels native. Native. YMMV, which is your mileage may vary, but reliable so far. That's pretty cool. Of course. I, I never thought about this but yeah why wouldn't that work that's a pretty no the reason i idea. um yeah so i i don't know i guess w- when catalina is running in the vm environment it thinks you're on a supported machine i guess is the the story here yeah because because it's it sees the vm as the machine not your specific mac which is the beauty of running inside a container it's why for example uh, it makes a lot of sense to run if let's say you're going to run a server somewhere. It makes a lot of sense to run the server inside a VM, even if you're only running one VM on your server, because it, that way, if and when the hardware needs to be replaced, you don't have to rebuild the server. You just move the virtual machine to a new 
piece of hardware run the same virtualization engine. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is the same, quote unquote, computer that I've been running on before because it sees, you know, in this case, parallels as the host computer, not a, you know, 2011 Mac, iMac or whatever. Right. right. Yeah. So that's actually pretty good. Right. OK. And here's the follow up. So this is why I wanted to run mail, because I did not put this in our box. But okay. I asked him what the machine was. And he said the unsupported Mac is an iMac mid 2011 with 16 gigs of RAM, AMD Radeon 6770M graphics and boot drive is an external Thunderbolt SSD. Because the internal drive sucks, or no, it's yeah, slow. Right. He said. Right. <laughs> but what a but yeah. So to... I guess 2011 is the it, yeah. I think the minimum for for um, Catalina is uh, for the most part 2012 hardware and beyond. So That's 2011 right. just didn't cut it. Yep. Yep. I right, like thanks, it. Robert. Yeah, that's good, man. That's good. Um, take us to David, if you would. Okay. I, I thought you'd take us somewhere else, but we'll. No, it's uh, fine. We'll, we'll, fine. We'll, Let's we'll, go to David. Go we'll, we'll, to David. Hold on. <laughs> oh man. You want me to read David's? Uh, hold on. Here we go. Up. Oh, here we go. All right. David has some good feedback, which we love feedback, but we're not going to repeat it endlessly in this episode <laughs> like we did last time. Hi guys, I would like to provide my take on the new AirPods Pro. I'm a woodworker in my spare time. Normally, when in the shop and using power tools, I wear an over-the-ear headset with the built-in radio and is Bluetooth enabled. They broke, and I looked at several different noise-canceling devices. Most tend to be wired and not safe in the workshop. Mm. When I found out that the noise-canceling feature of the AirPods was about the same as my current device, I bought a pair. Best investment ever. <laughs> He didn't say ever, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Sure. Um, I would recommend them to anyone. Just my experience. And remember, no, I'm not going to read it. I can't. I'm going to break the rules. <laughs> what? All he said was feedback at MacGeekab.com, John. I know he said feedback at MacGeekab.com, Dave. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, sometimes you got to break the rules. It seems like the rules are meant to be broken. That's good. Uh, you were mentioning running Catalina native versus in a VM. And I have a different type of native that I want to talk about. And that is at native deodorant.com. I just came back from this trip to Nashville and I used native deodorant. In fact, I've been using it for several weeks, both at home and traveling. The nice part is the container is super compact, so it's easy to travel with even when you just have a carry on. The best part about native, though, is that it is safe, simple and effective. They've formulated this without aluminum, parabens or talc, and they've just filled it with ingredients found in nature. Hence the name native, such as coconut oil, shea butter, tapioca starch. They never test on animals and they offer you free shipping and returns and it works Using this aluminum-free deodorant does not mean having to sacrifice on product performance. I was out and about all day in Nashville every day. I only applied once. It was fantastic. Uh, I can understand why people love them. They have over 9,000 five-star reviews and it, it, for good reason. And this stuff smells great. I opted for the coconut and vanilla, which is their most popular scent. They have others like lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint. And then they have an unscented one for folks that don't like to have scent or some some people just can't have a scent, you know, on them all day. And that works out fine. Aluminum free, safe and effective and no risk to try because they offer free returns and exchanges in the U.S. Here is the deal. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code MGG during checkout. Again, that's nativedeodorant.com. Promo code MGG during checkout will get you 20% off your first purchase. Our thanks to Native at nativedeodorant.com for sponsoring this episode. All right, Mr. Braun. Uh, your turn. It is my turn. Okay, cool. Uh Jeff has a great question. It This is like a question that turns into a quick tip uh, because Jeff says, I have a problem and I've tried my Google Foo, uh, but I can't find anything that applies. He says, 
in the finders list view, how can I turn off this big honking preview that appears to the right of every window? I never want to have it there. I want the full window to be the columns of my list view. How do I do this? And I didn't even know this was a thing because I've never seen this preview, but this is the beauty of why it becomes a quick tip in the finders view menu. Uh, go to make sure you're in list view. So go to view as list and then uh, you can choose either show preview or hide preview. And sure enough, it will appear right there uh, in Mojave. It is about halfway down the list. And in Catalina, I believe it is right at the top of the list, if I'm not mistaken, but it's there show preview, hide preview. And at least in Mojave, it's command shift P to toggle that on or off. A really handy thing, actually, if you're looking at a, a folder full of like images or whatever, being able to see the preview right there, super handy. And if you don't want to see it, hide it. So thanks for asking, Jeff, because we love these kinds of questions because they turn into these quick little tips. Pretty cool, huh, John? Very. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, shall we keep going? You want to, since it was my, this turn, is the question that I thought we didn't have, but we did do. Okay. So, all right. right? Great. Yeah. Go ahead. So Larry, so Larry has, uh, I think a good one that is, uh, uh I'm just going to read it. Yeah. Oh. So Larry says, I have a Lassie two terabyte time machine backup drive from my Mac mini. Although the time machine app seems to be working well, it backed up 10 minutes ago. I'm getting warnings from Intego backup assistant perhaps installed by me at the time of adding Lassie. In, and it says that Lassie has not been backed up since October. First, do I need Intego Backup Assistant if the Time Machine app seems to be working well? Can I uninstall it? Secondly, I unwisely partition my Lassie at the time of installation, so now it appears I have only 500 of the two terabytes available without losing info, which is likely saved elsewhere iCloud, etc. So can I unpartition it, unpartition it so I can see all of the drive is available? Presently, I have 110 available of the 500. And that's a good question. Yeah, I think so. Looking. Uh, uh, so first I looked at this thing. So Intego, I think, was software that Lassie acquired at some point. Um, or partnered with or something. Or partnered with. So you. Yeah. Uh, yeah so when you buy a Lassie drive, you get Intego stuff. Um, the thing is. Uh, I looked at the the page for the software and um, it doesn't. Now, first off, Larry didn't tell us, but I'm assuming that he's running Catalina. And the thing is, as as if you don't know, we'll tell you. But um, the the way that drives are laid out under Catalina is a bit different in that you now have kind of two separate worlds. You have your system drive and your data drive, and it's linked by what, what are they called, Dave? Uh, uh, oh crap, not hard links, firm, firm links. Dang it. Firm links. I think that's Is it. Is that right? Yes. Okay. But anyway, so I, I'm suspecting that this software, which I, you know, um, is just backup software is getting upset, uh, assuming that he's on Catalina, that things have changed. So it just stops working. Um, and also when I looked at the page for this software, um, they don't list any compatibility info for Catalina. The The most recent they show is 10.14 Mojave. So I'm guessing it doesn't understand the new kind of split volume thing. Oh, that's um, entirely possible. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things like Carbon Copy Cloner, which we'll talk about again shortly, but that understood it and that it would come up and say, hey, you know, if you're going to Catalina, I'm going to have to, you know, it, well, here's an upgrade. Right. It's like, thanks. But right. it seems that this software has not kept up with with that world. So, yeah. So to answer uh, to answer his question, it, you know, you do not need to use if you are using Time Machine, you do not need the backup software that came with the device in order for Time Machine to work. I don't want to say you don't need the backup software that came with the device. We here recommend multiple backups happening, you know, to your data in different ways. So. This, you know, Intego stuff, if it works with the operating system you're using, certainly could be a secondary backup, but it is not required just because it came with the drive. It is not required for Time Machine uh, to run. Time Machine will run 
as long as your Mac can see the drive and it's formatted the right way, time machine's going to run no problem. Or in theory, <laughs> sometimes right. it doesn't. But there you go. Yeah. Right. So as far as the second issue, I actually did this in real life, Dave, because I wanted to give good advice here. Yeah. But as far as his external partition drive, as long as there's enough free space, you should be able to resize the partitions with this utility. So you run this utility, you select your disk, you go to partitions, and it's going to show you a little circle or a little map. And um, uh, so first off, you want to make sure that you know what data is on what partition because um, you can click on one of the partitions on the drive. And if you click on it, you, you're then going to see the, the you, or I'm sorry, click on the secondary partition and there's going to be a little minus sign. And you'll then get a warning saying partitioning this device will permanently erase the data stored on some of the partitions. You can't undo this action. So just make sure you know what data is and what partition, but disutility, and I think you, you suggested this in, in your reply, Dave, um, uh, it may work and it may not. My experience is that it did when I did it, but, but it was with a fresh new SSD that I just happened to have, but I wanted to verify this. So the thing is, disutility may be able to give you all your space back. Yeah, I, I've seen it work, you know, maybe half the time it, it it depends on how the volume was laid out now all of these problems go away if the drive is formatted as apfs because you're not it generally when you format apfs it is one partition that is then broken up into logical volumes but the volumes do not map directly to any given location on the disk it is just a blob of storage that is mapped to these volumes in a virtual way so that you can adjust sizes on the fly and you're not actually changing anything other than a, a limit uh, or you know of of how much space can be used but in this case if it's an hfs plus drive then yes it is partitions and I, disk utility can do it except when it can't and sometimes things are just laid out in a way that disk utility says, no, I can only I can only go so big or, uh, you know, I can't get any smaller on this one, even though you don't have, um, you know, a lot of data there. It just I don't know. There's things out there. So I, before you do any of this, I would if there's important data there, I would clone it off or back it up just in case, because repartitioning is, you know, right. Who knows? Yeah. And lastly, yes. So. If for whatever reason the resizing doesn't work, you should be able to copy the backup data from your existing backup drive to another drive, reformat and repartition, right? And then copy the data back. And you know what? I'm just so glad that I found this dandy. I just like saying dandy. <laughs> it's fair. Support article from Apple, which goes into excruciating detail. And the title of it is Transfer Time Machine Backups from One Backup Disk to Another. Cool. Which I would say definitely applies in this case because um, a direct connected drive and a network connected drive, as far as time machine concerned, are kind of different. And from what I saw in this article, it goes into detail about how you deal with this situation. Yeah. And lastly, as I think you suggested, um, I would not use Time Machine as my sole backup strategy in that you want to use something. Uh, I mentioned Carmi Copy Cloner. I love it, Dave. I think you love it. Um, yeah, super duper Carbon Copy Cloner. Uh, the, Backblaze you know, if you want to go to the cloud, right? Yeah, well, you so, should have some sort of that. cloud backup uh, so that you're not right. storing all your data locally. That, But that could be iCloud or, you know, a Dropbox or that sort of thing. I know that we've all been trained to say that sync is not backup, but the reality is if your sync engine offers versioning, meaning it saves multiple versions of files and isn't just the sync of the most recent version of a given file, then it kind of is a backup because it's storing, you know, the old version of the work that you did. And if you mess up and delete or change something in a way that you don't want, mm -hmm. you restore. So I think iCloud, you know, documents and data or desktop and 
but documents and desktop or um, or Dropbox or some anything like that. As long as it's storing your data off site somewhere, uh, something could happen, you know, catastrophic where either everything's stolen from your house or office or everything is burned or whatever. As long as you've got something in the cloud, your data is going to, you know, it, 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 there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't, you know, I was looking, we had another related question here. Sorry to go off on a tangent because we never do that ever, ever, <laughs> but I don't think iCloud versions things. Um, is that right? I thought iCloud did version things. I thought you I was go- looking the other day. I, I I know definitely Dropbox does. I, th- I think sure. iCloud will will keep track. Will let you restore deleted things, but I don't think it does what what I call versioning, where where it has the old version of a file. Right. Right. Huh. Huh. I thought it did, but I could be wrong. Um. We'll look into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe some of If you are- want to let us know about your retrieval experience, um, well, you know where to reach us. <laughs> That's right. Well, and hopefully somebody in the chat room at MacGeekCab.com slash stream will uh, will help us there because that would be that would be a good thing. I thought I thought you could do it on the web. I thought there was a versioning thing on the web with iCloud Drive. But I could I, I could very well be conflating that with every other cloud service that exists. So we will move on and uh, and then and then hopefully we will come back to this. So uh, in the meantime, speaking of exactly that, Donald asks a question. He says, um, I'm using the new Apple Podcasts app on the Mac and I feel like I have lost the ability to show Mac Geek Gab's chapter marks. I can't find them and I miss them. And Donald's right. We, for years, over a decade now, have been putting chapters into every episode so that if, for example, you want to uh, go back and listen to a segment about, you know, how, how did we get those previews in Finder List View or this segment doesn't interest you because you already know how to get chapters. So you want to skip ahead to the next one where JP asks us about extracting a video. Uh, you can do that. And the chapters will show you exactly where to go. And in fact, you can just tap them and you are good to go. The chapters in the Apple podcast app on the Mac in Catalina are there in the upper. When you're playing an episode in the upper right hand corner, you will see a little icon that has lines with dots next to them that is to represent chapters click that and they will slide in from the right side of the screen and show you the timestamps and the name of the chapter you just click and go on ios while you're playing it in the apple podcast app scroll up it's kind of like when you're looking for lyrics in the music app there's a bunch of things you'll have a, a screen up that appears to show you everything you need. And it's not entirely intuitive that there are things that this is a longer page and you're just seeing the top of it. But in fact, that's what's happening. Move that page up by scrolling it just like you would a web page. And you'll see more things appear on the bottom. One of those things is chapters. You can turn it on. And then of course the same sort of thing, you get the list of chapters with the timestamps and you can tap them and it'll bring you right there. Third party podcast app also generally all support chapters. Our Mac geek gab app that is available for free in the iOS store uh, supports chapters. And so you can use that too, but, um, but there, there you go. So I will, I will put a link to the Mac geek gab app there for, uh, for anyone. So thanks for asking, Donald. It's always good to remind, especially new listeners, that we have chapters. Do you have a thought on that, Mr. Braun, or should we uh, go to JP? Uh, no thought here, but we did get feedback in our chat room here from our pal Brian saying, uh, yeah, uh, uh, as we suspected, so uh, recently deleted is a feature of iCloud Drive slash photos, but not versioning per se. And I, I think that's the same case with Dropbox. Mm-mm. Dropbox no? definitely okay. has versioning. So, okay. Can, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Depending so, on whether okay. it's free or not, you either get 30 days or up oh, to your storage. Okay. But Right. But, okay. I remember this. So that's a condition. of this. So depending on the type of membership you have with Dropbox, you may. Well, you'll have versioning. versioning. It's either 30 days with the free account or longer than that if you pay. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Got it. All right. Cool. Very good. Uh, all right. Uh, JP, as I alluded, asks, he says, fellers, I want to use an animated golf course flyover video from a golf course app uh, I played this year and use in my home video. Any ideas on how to get the video out of the app? The iOS screen record function will not allow me to record it. The screen just goes black. Can I open an iOS app like a package on my Mac and harvest the vittles? Um, and I, so, no, you can't do it that way uh, because the iOS app, it, it is a package, but it is uh, encapsulated in a way that I don't I don't know of any way to pull it out of there. Of course, if somebody does, please let us know. But um, I have a few ideas. The first is you can capture the screen as a movie from your iPhone using QuickTime player. So you launch QuickTime player, um, you connect your iPhone via USB. I don't think you can do it Wi-Fi, but maybe you can. And you do new movie recording from the file menu in QuickTime player. And it will, uh, it will allow you when you pull that up, when the movie recording comes up, there will be the red circle in the middle of the screen that will start recording from say the camera Right next to that is a little carrot pointing down. If you click that, you will see all of the quote unquote cameras that it can copy or that it can capture from. One will be your Apple TV if you have one on the network. And the other one should be your iPhone or iPad if it's connected. So try that because that might allow you to capture this movie from the golf course flyover. Failing that, it's also worth trying an app called ScreenFlow. This is a for pay app, but you can try it for free. It'll put a watermark over the uh, the resulting video, but you'll be able to see whether behind the watermark is the flyover you want uh, or if, in fact, uh, these kinds of things are blocked no matter what. But I think QuickTime Player is going to is going to be able to do this for you, JP. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it, the, the, they didn't always understand external devices, but I, I think that'd be a good bet. Of course, there's also the analog route. <laughs> well, that's true. I thought about that. Yeah, I don't think that, I mean, depending on how nice The quality his... won't be great, but right. what, what I'm saying is that you get a camera, you know, either a video capable uh, uh, camera or a video camera and record it from the screen itself. Yeah. Um, you know, if it has a high enough resolution thing and you get a, you know, a mount and a tripod or something like that there, it may. Yeah, you yeah. probably get that's, it pretty that's, close. That's, that's, that's the Stone Age <laughs> kind of low tech way of doing it. But that's the way to get around any sort of DRM, which that's I think true. is what we're kind of dealing with. Right. Yeah. No, that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, we have a couple of tips to share about. Trading in or trading up. Steven will start us off here. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, this is Steve from the UK, a long time listener, first time caller. Just really regarding the trade in for Apple's iPhones. You actually take your phone in and they assess it and then they actually give you a gift card to the Apple store for that value. And then you can use that to purchase another item. But I did ask them what happens if I didn't want to buy another item. And they said you can then trade that gift card in for cash, but they had to give you a gift card first of all in order to process the trade in. Hope that helps. This is where you cut me off. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah, that's I had no idea that that's hmm. how that worked. So you don't have to be buying something else to use Apple's trade in pricing for uh, for your iPhone. So that that might be a great way to to do things. I would definitely check that pricing before you. Um, you know, before you, I mean, as part of your, your survey, declutter has worked out well for me recently. So I would also look at them and see who's going to give you the best price and, and then take the money. There you go. Uh, Brand shared something along the similar lines. He says in late August, I bought a tricked out 2015 MacBook pro for $2,200 from Apple's refurb store. I wanted to fill an upcoming need in my business with a machine with a good keyboard and lots of ports while I could. I stuck the unopened box in the closet. 
Then last week, the 16 inch MacBook Pro dropped and I was suffering some buyer's remorse. I called Apple to see what kind of trade I might get. Initially, it looked bleak, but the business sales guy suggested escalating the issue to the service folks, which I did. Bottom line, Apple offered to take the 2015 machine back at my full purchase price with free return shipping three and a half months after purchase. I think my situation was just a one-off, and I certainly don't expect to be treated this generously again. But I thought that Apple, again, deserves kudos for putting themselves in the consumer's shoes. Don't try this with your car dealer, folks. <laughs> yeah, that that's fantastic. Um, it shows that it's worth asking. I. I always say polite persistence goes a long way with a lot of companies and Apple is most certainly one of them. Um, what, what a deal. And that, how about that new 16 inch MacBook pro, John, are you, uh, is this tempting you now? Finally, is something like, cause you I've like seen that the big posts. Screen. I'm starting to salivate over it because it looks like they've made enough advancements and the keyboard doesn't suck, which yeah. <laughs> was really the thing that I, I got to be honest, that scared not only me, but a lot of people, because Apple had a really bad run with the, uh, the what butterfly the, keyboard, the, the butterfly. Yeah. And now they went back to the scissor. Yep. Yep. So um, but also like, you know, the sound system, everybody says is like, you know, really crazy and. uh yeah, when I and saw that, all of it, and and the the amount of you know, the, I mean, the processor, the memory. Um, I mean, you'll pay, you, you'll pay dearly. <laughs> well, not as dearly as I would have thought. Like, I'm, I was impressed, especially if you can wait a couple of months until it appears on refurb. But I mean, you can get that 16 inch MacBook Pro with a six core i7, 16 gigs of RAM, 512 storage for 2,400 bucks new. That's pretty. I mean, I thought that would be twenty nine ninety nine. To be perfectly oh, okay. honest, that's pretty good. Um, I think. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good. Uh, you know, um, yeah. I I don't think it's that. I, that's a big screen though. I don't like for me that would be way too big to travel with. Um, really? Okay. Because 16 my inches? my yeah. my portable for probably a decade has been the 15 inch right. version of the MacBook pro. Right. And I think the um, new 16 is, is either the same dimensions or, or maybe even smaller. Cause they've got the, the thin bezel on that screen. Right. So it's not, it's not much bigger if at all bigger than your 15. So, but the 15 was, was too big for me too. It like, I like the 11, the 13 is a decent compromise for me. It's a, it's a big enough screen that, I, you know, I don't mind traveling with it, but, um, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, I thought uh, about you as soon as I saw that, I'm like, oh, this might be the well, thing. I, I posted, yeah, I did some Twitter posts about it and I'm like, you know, this may be enough to push me over the edge to, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, um, uh, my 2012 does what I need, but could I do more? And with the 16 inch, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I'm so I got to, uh, so I got to, uh, weigh my options here. How, how much does it weigh? Speaking of that, um, the, the 13 inch MacBook pro is three pounds. The 13 inch MacBook air is like 2.6 or something. The 16 inch MacBook pro. Oh, that's a heavy thing. That's 4.3 pounds. So two kilograms that's 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 nothing to sneeze at that's a lot to lug around in today's world it might be lighter than what you have in your 15 though to be fair but he, like i noticed the difference between the air at 2.65 or something and the pro at three for sure um and I, I was happy to revert back to my air recently but um but if you want that big screen, you know, then you're, it's going to be, it's going to be way more. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, maybe you'll, maybe you'll get one before CES. Maybe, maybe we can play with it there. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Perhaps I'll have to talk to one of our contacts to see if I can get a deal. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Cause I don't think it's going to be in the refurb store for quite a while. Uh, it, it's pr <laughs> probably not that. I mean, probably not before January, but, 
but probably before February. I mean, right in that time frame was when the MacBook Air last year hit, and that was that was released about this same time. So, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Fun, yeah, fun. I mean, I think the biggest news is that they got past the. Uh, but Apple more or less admitted that they screwed up with the with the keyboard keyboard design. Yeah. yeah. Well, mine has already been replaced and upgraded to the the like the latest and greatest of the butterfly keyboards. And that happened six months in. So, uh, and this new one feels pretty good. Like I feel like it might actually last, but right in the, yeah, the, you know, from what I, I've read here and there, the, the plastic was, you know, the keys would break. They weren't easy to replace and stuff like that. So the thing is, it would start doubling. Like you would, you would, you know, hit a key. Oh yeah. Oh, well that's fun. Oh no, it it wasn't. (laughs) Both Lucas and I bought airs, you know, before Christmas. They were our Christmas presents last year. And um, and both of us have had the keyboards replaced on them. So, you know, there you go. But now we're okay. Now well, we're okay. Apple, well, hey, you know, they, they make good when, when they need to, right? Eventually, yeah. <laughs> you know, who also makes good, John, is Mac Weldon, our next sponsor. I never really understood the importance of quality clothing until I started wearing Mack Weldon stuff a few years ago. They want you to be comfortable. They want you to have stuff that's going to last. They believe in smart design, premium fabrics and simple shopping. And boy, howdy is shopping simple at Mack Weldon. Like the, the, the pictures are right there, but Everything, sizing, all of that right in front of you. I have recently, I mentioned in the the last spot that I was interested in checking out their socks. Well, I wore some for our trip to Nashville and like these socks are amazing. So comfortable and like just the right amount of cushion and cushiness and coziness and all of that stuff. It's great. And I wore their shirts that I've had for like three years now, I bought a couple of t-shirts uh, three years ago that I wear a lot when I travel that I put uh, underneath my, you know, my clothes or whatever, my, you know, my over shirt, I guess you would call it my regular shirt. Then it there, it, it's like cool and comfortable and man, like you just need to check this stuff out. They really, really know what they're doing. And they truly convinced me that this is the kind of clothing I want to wear. It's worth trying out because if your experience is like mine, Mack Weldon will be the most comfortable underwear, shirts and socks or undershirts and socks that you've worn that that's what I've tested out from them. And every single thing just like right to the top of the list for me. And you get a deal just for being a Mac geek gab listener. You get 20% off your first order by visiting MacWeldon.com, M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N.com, and enter promo code M-G-G to get 20% off your first order. You got to check it out. Go to MacWeldon.com, promo code M-G-G for 20% off your first order. Our thanks to Mac Weldon for making such cozy clothes and for sponsoring this episode. All right, Mr. Braun, let's see where we are here. Let's let's uh let's share some more tips. I mentioned in the intro to the show that we had uh a great idea about using Chrome profiles and sure enough in 788 uh we were talking about needing to be logged into different Google accounts as primaries and I was using multiple browsers to accomplish that. Jeff says I have a similar situation to Dave, where I need to be logged into multiple accounts of one vendor. Chrome profiles work amazingly well. You have to set up a different email address for each Chrome profile, but if you have a Gmail address, well, that solves this problem. Uh, if, If you're looking to do it for Google accounts, you're good to go. If you're not looking to do it for Google accounts, you can still do it because, and here's like the bonus tip that Jeff baked into this, if you have, say, you know, user at gmail.com. Like for example, I have Dave Hamilton at gmail.com. I do not use this account because there are at least 10 other Dave Hamiltons that use the same email address 
And so all I have there is an autoresponder that says you didn't reach the Dave Hamilton you're looking for. In any event, Dave Hamilton at gmail.com does get to me. But so does Dave Hamilton plus client A at gmail.com and Dave Hamilton plus client B at gmail.com because Gmail is built to do it that way. You don't have to go configure anything. You just put in, you know, your username plus whatever you want at gmail.com. And that address is an alias to your main address. Super simple. And what a great idea. And he says that saves me from having to use multiple browsers. I like it, Jeff. That's cool stuff. Okay. So to be clear, yeah. Chrome is a browser. Correct. And they offer a profiles preference, I would think. And that's where you do this work. That's where you're doing this. Yeah. You can set up different profiles okay. in the same browser. Yeah. Great, great clarification. Thank you. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Because personally, my order of preference for browsers is I pretty much run Safari. As sure. I think most of our listeners, but maybe not. And right. then if a page doesn't work, which happens sometimes when, well, depending on who put your page together, if sure. they don't know what they're doing, then I go to Firefox and then my third choice is Chrome. But uh, Chrome does offer some bonus features like this, which, uh, which yeah, I, cool. I, so. I used to follow that same cascading order chrome or uh with chrome at the end and and then you know safari firefox chrome and i have found that firefox is less and less likely to render things the way i want um <laughs> if i if i need that my secondary browser nowadays is chrome um pretty in a pretty standard okay. way and then and, and I, then I firefox think I'm with is the you third. too because yeah. Every time I launch Firefox, it's like, hey, here's a new version. And it's like, OK, that that's great. But like every time I launch you, you come up with a new version. I mean, that's I mean, what's up with that? Well, Chrome does that, too. You just don't notice it. They're very good. Right. At, it's the secret. Background. It's the secret update. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, listener Kurt was having a battery drain problem. We talked about it back in episode 784. And Kurt was. His problem was if he had certain web pages open, but he didn't know which ones in Safari and put his computer to sleep, he would lose, you know, somewhere between, say, 10 and 12 percent of his battery overnight. Um, and, you know, we talked about different things it could be. Of course, we said try and narrow down, you know, closing tabs and see which websites it is that cause, you know, this battery drain. Try and turn off like, you know, energy savers, app nap and that sort of thing. He tried all of that and wasn't able to narrow it down in a in a time frame that, you know, he's an impatient guy like we are. But uh, he said, I did find something that fixed it. He says, um, I poured over the logs and I couldn't figure it out. But uh, he says, I'm trying to find uh, it was says it wasn't linked to the Wi-Fi environment, but uh, while looking for clues as to that the laptop was secretly waking up, I decided to punt and I used the command sudo space PM set dash B auto power off delay 1800. And I will put that command in the show notes so that we are all on the same page. Uh, he says what that will do is it causes the laptop to go into low power sleep after 1800 seconds, which for those of you playing along at home is half an hour uh, while on battery power. The half hour delay, he says, was a compromise to get the laptop laptop back to instant operation in situations where he might be working intermittently uh, and the laptop had gone to sleep while his attention was you know, temporarily diverted or whatever. He says this completely solved the issue for him. His laptop can now sleep for days without losing more than a percentage point or two in battery charge. And he says, with today's laptops, there really is no downside. He says, yes, the laptop has to load a RAM image off of a file when you wake it up. But the SSDs in these are so ridiculously fast. And he's right, like 1400 megabytes a second, even on my air, uh, that the delay really isn't noticeable. It just blasts it up and you're good to go. So that's a good one. Uh, he says he'd also like to suggest that um, there's an article that Howard Oakley uh, at Eclectic Light, who makes all kinds of apps that we recommend constantly here on the show. He wrote an article on this PM set command and power management in general. And he says it's a great resource for anyone looking to understand 
how power management works on Apple products. So we will put that in the show notes as well. Thoughts on this, John? Nope. All right. Mm. All right. Cool. Now I like a uh, eclectic light. Yeah. Don't they make a, yeah, they make a, a they make silent night and T T two M two and yep. It, oh, and good news. Happy update. Just to let everybody know. Remember I was going on about how I was having time machine backup issues. Yes. Well, you know what solved it, Dave was <laughs> I took a CCC backup carbon copy cloner. Yep. Um, erased the drive in my MacBook Pro after making a backup, reformatted it and as APFS, and uh, everything's dandy. So it was don't your stall anymore. It was your source drive that needed to be refreshed. Let's say, correct, because it was a victim of the oh. APFS migration versus doing a fresh install, which you would think. Because we told everybody that you should do this, that I would know better, but I didn't because, you know, I, I, it's just the way I am. But <laughs> so once I reformatted it and then restored the backup from CCC, um, uh, my backups have not stalled or just not have been performed. So that makes me happy. That's pretty good, man. I think it was just, it was just, you know, uh, corruption was just, you know, but because of the conversion route versus the reformatting route, I think corruption was just getting worse and worse. And at some point it got so bad that, you know, time machine was just like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now it's working great. So, so my time machine stuff is working great. So the thing is, if you haven't yet already, if you do have a drive that is converted to APFS, you may want to do a fresh restore. We've said this a couple of times, but I didn't listen. It's my fault. <laughs> but now I'm good. Now you're good. Cool. Awesome. That I'm glad that I'm glad that worked. I yeah, it it doesn't surprise me that eventually these drives that were migrated from HFS plus to APFS <clears throat> are gonna need, you know, a little bit of it's just going to need to be wiped out. And, but thankfully, I mean, that, the, the process of doing that for you was no big deal, right? You just cloned and, and, I cloned, and restored. I erased, you know, I reformatted and then I restored and, you know, carbon copy cloner was like, oh, hey, you're booting from a, a you know, a backup. Uh, you want me to kind of hold your hand through this whole process? And it's like, yeah, sure. Thanks. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've seen that notice. I've never... I've never used it because I've never been in been in that scenario since they added it. I'm trying to think of how I did it when I did mine, but I I don't remember Carbon Copy Cloner being so so like I mean I used it, but I I don't think it I'd let it like do the hand holding thing. I mean maybe I just like is option. that it's smart enough. It's like dude, you're booting from a clone, so maybe you're trying to restore to somewhere else, and it's like yeah. <laughs> yeah good thinking yeah right all right cool um in 788 we were talking about different uh things and gerard points out he says uh i heard you talking about using DuckDuckGo for searching but sometimes going to google uh he says if you use startpage.com you get google searches without tracking uh, if you go to startpage.com and scroll down, they explain how they use Google searches in their search engine, but not directly connecting you to Google. So that's actually pretty cool so that you can get Google searches um, without without having Google track you, which is cool. I like that. Uh, the cool part, though, is what Jan and many, many others of you pointed out to me. Uh, but we'll read Jan's here. He says, um, he says, imagine my shock and horror listening as last episode. You continued to say, Dave, that sometimes you still pasted a search into Google to get a different, sometimes better result. Do you not know that using exclamation point G before a search in DuckDuckGo will send the search request to Google from the DuckDuckGo infrastructure? <sighs> Do you not know that the search would go way faster? Did you just get caught? The 
exclamation point G, or as we like to call it in uh, computer terminology, the bang G is what DuckDuckGo calls a bang. And you can go to DuckDuckGo.com slash bang. It's a shortcut to search through another search engine quickly from DuckDuckGo. And you can use Google, Wikipedia, Amazon, Twitter, etc. He says, I have DuckDuckGo installed as the default search engine everywhere. And in those rare instances, instances where it does not provide me with what I need, I just type the bang to get me to Google search results. I've even taken it a step further and used the built-in macOS and iOS text re replacement to expand XG into bang G. That way I do not have to type shift one plus G on my iOS devices. Oh yeah, that's smart. He says, because that's a pain. I can just type X G whatever. And I'm off to the races. You can put bang G at the end of your search results. I found this weekend while in Nashville too, because I was looking for something and was like, ah, duck, duck, go. And then I remembered, Oh, Hey, I saw all those emails from everybody that told me about this bang search. Let's try. And I just added it to the end of the search in the bar in iOS and boom, up comes Google with the search results. Now, using Gerard's idea of start page would be potentially even better because it's not tracking you while you do it uh, and you're still getting Google results. But, um, but nevertheless, you can do this. And, I, and like I said, there's all kinds of them. So we will put a link to DuckDuckGo's bank shortcuts in, uh, in the mm. show notes so that you can so that you can learn about all of them. Yeah, it's I mean, there's tons of them. It's such a cool thing. Uh, bang eBay, okay. bang Twitter. So they, hmm? Bang eBay, bang Twitter, bang Reddit, bang Steam, bang Stap Overflow, bang Maps. You can just go straight and search Maps. It's pretty cool. Okay. So they kind of anonymize the... Uh, no. no. No, no, no. They just take oh, your okay. search and start page anonymizes oh, it. it. DuckDuckGo okay. just takes your search and hands it off. Yeah. So you're you're actually going to Google when you do this. Um, so yeah, yeah, okay. no, it's, yeah, I know it's pretty cool. Um, I, I like it. I, I will confirm that here, but I'm, I, I did it quick this weekend. Bang G go. And I am getting results from Google. So yeah, it just brings me to Google. So yeah, no anonymization, but pretty cool stuff. So I got caught, John, and I learned. And that's like, that's what we do here. I like yes, it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, all right. JP has a question. He says, fellers. Yeah, it's the same JP from earlier in the episode. You might remember. JP in LA, right? Or in Maine. I don't know where he is. He, oh, he's yeah. A, he's, he's a bi-coastal he's dude. The place. Yeah. He says uh, he's a premium listener at MacGeekab.com slash premium. He says, fellers, now that Apple dumped back to my Mac in July, what's the best way to log into my out of state Mac in, say, L.A. from my iMac in Maine? I've tried VNC colon slash slash IP address in the connect to server menu, but it will not work. Is it true you can't screen share or remote access your Macs unless they are on the same network nowadays? Or is my situation an anomaly? All of my computers, or at least both in this scenario, have screen sharing on, remote login on, file sharing on. So no, uh, JP, your situation is not an anomaly. There are a few ways. VNC, which is what Apple uses at the core of its screen sharing with some enhancements, let's say, uh, will work across the Internet, but it requires exposing your remote computer to the Internet, internet with port forwarding. Um, by default, VNC answers on port 5900, so you could port forward your router's 5900 to your iMac's 5900 and be good to go, but that comes with a mild security risk. In fact, it might be more than mild because now you're going to have people hacking to get right in to your Mac. Um, a better option is to use a third-party app, and there are lots of them. The one that I use is uh, from a company called Edovia called Screens or Screens Connect. You run this app on your Mac and it registers you with Screens Connect and then you can run Screens, a really full featured VNC client on either your iOS devices or another Mac. And it will traverse your firewalls for you with this Screens Connect engine and you are good to go. So that's the one that I use. I see 
Somebody in the chat room uh, is actually several people are mentioning uh, John in the chat room says remote PC is what he uses. Warren says team viewer. You can use all of these as, as we mentioned, be careful with team viewer. At some point they decide that you're using it for commercial right, uses right. and shut you off. But yeah, all of th- there are lots of options. What, what do you use John? Um, well, the one I've, I've used in the past, um, log me in. Is yep. another one? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. So there are a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the, you know, is the, the, I mean, you have to get a bit down and dirty to enable the screen sharing option in a uh, Mac OS and then put the hole in your firewall. So, uh, but I think most of our listeners know how to do that. Um, I, I acknowledge your risk of someone taking over your, your network. So, you know, use a good password and stuff like that. But I, I think that is, you know, a place to start. Right. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Brian Monroe in the chat room points out something called Chrome remote desktop. Uh, and it looks like this might work um, from the Mac, which I did not realize. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. You can't use it with. Oh, it's possible actually Catalina Safari will do this because WebRTC has been added there, but it does require a technology called WebRTC, but Chrome will do that. And of course, Chrome is available for free as well. So uh, I'm just on Mojave here in the studio still because I haven't upgraded this particular machine to Catalina. But um, but yeah, that would uh, that would work. Honestly, the way I, I do use um, Screens Connect because it's simple and it just works. But another way to do it would be to set up a VPN, the VPN into your other network. And then from there, you can use VNC just like you're on the same network, because that's essentially what a VPN does is it tunnels you through and puts you on that other network. So if you have a router or some device like a Synology disk station that can act as a VPN server, that's another way to get around uh, this. And, And I use that sometimes, too. So, yeah. Now, is Apple Remote Desktop even a thing anymore? Absolutely. I haven't really played with it lately. Okay, it is, so but it's Apple it's local, uh, local network only. Um, um, I mean, unless you do some port forwarding or VPN or whatever, but it it doesn't have a a a a, 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 a firewall type option like Screens Connect does. Right to configure, yeah. So yep. people can get in. Okay. Correct. Cause I, I remember you and I played with it and yeah. you know, it's, it's good for what it is. I, I haven't actually run it. I still use it so. actually locally on my network. I use okay. it all the time because I find that for whatever reason in the finder, you know, sometimes machines don't show up in the list. And so to use, you know, screen sharing just from, you know, from triggered by the finder. So I just leave Apple remote desktop in my sidebar and I run that. And I'm good to go. I think it's free with a developer account. I, like I haven't bought it in a long time. And I don't know if that's because I have a developer account or if it's because I bought it a long time ago and they just keep upgrading me. I can't, I can't, I couldn't tell you. So there you go. And then of course there's Microsoft remote desktop, which. Does that, <clears throat> does that work as a, I know it works as a client on the Mac. Is there any right. remote desktop server for the Mac? <sighs> I'll have to look into it. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure, but I remember using that at some point. Yeah. I mean, especially, uh, duh, if you're in a Microsoft environment. Oh, sure. Still do make a Mac client, which is, is, is nice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a client. Yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, all right. Uh, in a sort of similar vein, Ken asked, um, in error, uh, I clicked on desktop and documents folders in system preferences, iCloud, iCloud drive, and I found both of these file structures on iCloud and not on my Mac. Following an Apple tech's advice, I created a folder on my desktop with different names. When I try to copy a folder from iCloud to the new folder on my desktop, all I get is a file named data.textclipping. So the operative question is, how do I restore my desktop and documents folders to my Mac? Great question. So in this scenario, your data is on iCloud. Uh, And you can confirm that by going to the web interface of iCloud.com, like we were talking about earlier in the show, 
and you can download things from there, but it's not on your, on your Mac. Uh, assuming that what I would do is uncheck the, the box that you checked in system preferences, iCloud, iCloud drive, and give your Mac some time to process. Um, then reboot it and recheck the box and see if it slurps it all down from iCloud, right? As long as it's up there on iCloud, you're, it, like, it, you will be able to get it back down to your Mac. So the idea is let's sort of trick this thing into getting back down on your Mac. If once all the data is there, and maybe that's the question you're asking, if you turn it off, what will happen is it will move all this data into a different folder that will no longer be synced and then you can, and, and then it will recreate a desktop folder and a documents folder so that you can put this data back in there and have it back to being locally only on your Mac. Does that make sense? Have you done anything like this, John? Yeah, I was kind of mystified when I first enabled this option because all of a sudden it's like, well, where'd my stuff go? Right. So, you don't so have a desktop or documents folder anymore. Well, you do. But they don't live in your home folder. They live in your right. iCloud Drive folder, which and is what a I've weird. done. And so here's a an extra added tip, and maybe you'll learn at least one additional thing listening to this. Is I would take that folder, which is where is it, Dave? It's in Home oh, Library Mobile right. Documents. Mobile Documents. So if you take that folder, which actually maps to iCloud, I think in the Finder, iCloud right? Drive in the Finder. Yep. Right. If you take that folder and you put it in your sidebar, it makes life a lot easier. Well, it should already right. be in your sidebar named iCloud Drive. But if it's not, um, then yes. Yes. No, you're correct. But the um, I like having the explicit um, <clears throat> machine-specific folder in the sidebar. Okay. I mean, it's the same folder, right? There's no difference. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, yeah, it, well, it used to be that that didn't appear there. It, it was, you know, just sort of hidden away. And so like the library folder, we got in the habit of putting that in our sidebars, but now it should be there in the iCloud section and iCloud drive. So, okay. yeah. Well, good, good. Yeah. I found it really handy to have um, my documents and desktop folder in the cloud. I'm I'm using that more than I expected to. Just having my desktop folder synced between multiple computers and stuff. Yeah, let's see. No, I think you're you're yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I see there's iCloud Drive, then there's documents, and then there's a folder specific to the machine. So it's kind of buried. Very much buried. Yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. All right. Um where are we here on time? We have time for a couple of cool stuffs found, Mr. Braun. Uh, mm. The first is from listener Robin, who says, uh, I know it is recommended to only use your Mac account in standard user mode, but I find this too restrictive most of the time. So I would set up my account in admin mode, which quite frankly is, I think, what most of us do, even though we know that we shouldn't. <laughs> and, you know, whatever. But Robin says... I spotted the following tip on one of the Mac sites recently. It is for an app called Privileges from a little company called SAP. And there's a link to this app on GitHub. He says Privileges allows you to use your Mac in standard mode, but to quickly and easily add admin privileges to your account and to keep them for a defined short period. I've not yet installed it, he says, but it does look cool. And I thought I would bring it to your attention. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. It, um, it allows you to sort of it, 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 sort of like using sudo from the command line. It, it just and I, my guess is that it is employing something of the sort, uh, but it just lets you, you know, add, add, enhance your privileges for a short period and then kind of tighten back down. So, yeah, I like it. That's a good one. That might actually allow us to be what we want is security and convenience simultaneously. And those are tough things to accomplish together. I will say that Apple as a company has been pretty good at delivering security and convenience simultaneously, like with touch ID and things like that, uh, to be able to make life and face ID for sure. Um, that like that is the, the best they've done so far. Cause it just sort of happens, which is great. 
So thanks, Robin. That's good stuff. Um, I noticed, John, today, at least I noticed it today. I'm not sure when it happened, maybe last week. GPG Suite uh, version 2019.2 is now Catalina compatible, which means you can use uh, GPG inside of mail to encrypt and decrypt your um, your messages now. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but nice to see them get Catalina compatibility finally. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. I actually kind of gave up on them. I, I, know. I actually deleted them because so GPG, here's the deal. GPG is, I think uh, the, the best way to put it is a peer to peer encryption model. Would That's you right. Agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it uses PGP encryption. It just, they call it GPG suite because they, want to be different right but But the thing is you have to authenticate people that say hey you want my keys or right you you want to exchange keys whereas the other model which is the s my model is reliant on what we call a certification authority so correct correct that's right yep but gpg keychains all also can sync with um uh, like a, a, a key server so that and you can you can give people authority right. on the key server right like we can we could all get together and say i i confirm that the person with that key is john f braun and if you have 10 people that do that then when somebody looks you up on the key server they can be like oh that key probably does belong to the john f braun that i think it belongs to that's great you know those sorts of things so yeah Shared key encryption mode, web of trust, as listener John points out in the chat room. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Pretty good. Because the other model, until, um, who was it? Who who were those guys? Um, <laughs> Which guys? The guys that decided not to give away certificates every year. Oh, Komodo or whoever acquired yes. them most yes. recently. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the other model. That's and right. And now they're like, oh, well, we want money for doing this thing for you and it's like what are you nuts that's right well you know i it wouldn't surprise me if at some point apple becomes an s mime certificate authority and bakes that in well isn't you know i mean the thing is i've been you know i got some new synologies like you probably did but even if you didn't encrypt me is a up and coming service you mean let's encrypt encrypt let's encrypt yeah let's encrypt is is the one yeah yeah we use, well, I mean, we use Let's Encrypt for a lot of our SSL certs on the web. They just don't do SMIME, but many of our SSL certs that we use on the web, not the Mac Observer one, because we bought that before we started using Let's Encrypt, but a lot of the ones that we use um, are are just for free through Let's Encrypt. They have this great little engine. They're 90-day certificates, but it's great. I have a... a thing that runs every day on the server and it checks and it sees if a certificate is within 30 days of expiring it just goes and gets a new one which which on the web is all you need a 90 day cert for email would be a pain in the neck because people need to have your current cert they can't like when you visit a website you get the cert the moment you connect and it doesn't matter what was there the last time it it you know it just you just get it for that transaction Whereas with email, you want something that's a little longer lasting. Even a year sort of caused us trouble because we had people that had the old cert and, you know, it was always kind of a thing to make sure it propagated out. So, yeah, it would, I would be curious to see if they ever get into S mime or if Apple gets into it. It, would, it seems like Apple might, you know, I mean, they're sort of doing it with iMessage. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's encryptions and search. Right, right. And oddly enough, I don't know where the. It- I don't know where in my memory I got this, but encrypt.me is a, a thing. <laughs> encrypt.me is um, is a VPN service and they it used to okay. be something else. I think you get it for free when you have uh, Eero Plus or something like that. I think that's the one that's included with that. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, it's a VPN. It used to be Cloak is what they called it. And then uh, it was acquired and... Uh, and, and now it's encrypt.me. So, but yeah, I'm pretty sure cloak. Yeah. Cloak became encrypt.me. So there you go. All right. Yeah. 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 Um, 
I've got a couple more cool stuffs found to round this thing out. Uh, you know me. I love uh, all kinds of, well, I love listening to music when it sounds good. And I've got two things from JBL that are good for this holiday season. One is their JBL Live 500 BT headphones, their Bluetooth headphones. They pack up great for travel. There are 150 bucks. Actually, they're 149.95. And they've you can use your um you can't use the S Lady, but you can use Google Voice or the Amazon A Lady uh right there inside your headphones. And they have what they call ambient aware talk through technology. It's very similar to, I mean, it, Apple, Apple chooses to call their version of this, the, the, the transparency mode on the, on the new uh, AirPods pro same kind of thing. You just touch a button and it increases the ambient sound. So you can hear what's happening around you either for walking down the street or where I really find it handy is on an airplane. When I hear an announcement being made, I just click it on and now I don't have to take off my headphones, but I can hear the announcement coming through and all of that stuff. So I will put a link to these JBL live 500 BTs in there. They sound, man, they just, they're comfortable and they sound good and they pack up easy over the ear headphones. Uh, good stuff. So that's, that's one of my cool stuff's found. Uh, another one is the JBL pulse Four. I have been a fan of the JBL Pulse speaker since the first one came out, and it just keeps getting better. This is a speaker that is built to look like a lava lamp, and it really does. It's cool that you can have different light effects on it. I, If I have room in my suitcase, I will bring this one. Otherwise, I bring a JBL Flip with me because that one's a little bit tighter uh, in size. But if I have room, I bring this with me, and it's super nice to have in the hotel room you know, a nice like ambient light kind of thing. That's not just the weird hotel lighting and all of that. And it's kind of cool to have, you know, the sound sort of synced with the, with the lighting and all of that cool stuff. The new one is super clear. Uh, the old pulses had like a mesh around them at, at times of the first couple of versions of it. But this now it's just like clear glass and it's full 360 degree led. Cause the sound only comes out the top. But it sounds great too. So, um, so it's 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 like a guilty pleasure, I guess. But isn't that the point of like entertainment and music and all of that stuff, right? It's it's good. Um, one last cool stuff found before we wrap up, John, is a service called TuneMyMusic.com. T U N E MyMusic.com that allows you to transfer playlists between streaming music services. It supports Apple Music, of course, Spotify, mm -hmm. Tidal, Deezer, YouTube, Pandora, Amazon Music, Google Play Music, RDO. I think I got them all. So if you move from one service to the other, you decide, hey, like, yeah, I feel like Spotify is a better thing for me than Apple Music or Apple Music is better than Spotify, whatever. You don't have to lose your playlists. You just sign up. You have to have both running simultaneously and it'll just convert your playlist from one to the other and you can shut down the old one, which is pretty darn cool. So I put that in the... Uh, so is it that there are different playlist data formats that they understand? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're completely different and they are all incompatible with each other. No. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, these so guys this figured out. Oh, yeah, this nice. this rebuilds it essentially. It it parses your playlist on one engine and then, you know, rebuilds it on another, which which is cool. Yeah. Sweet. I know. It's good stuff, man. These it's good. These people know uh well, they know what they're doing, which is, you know, sort of the point because uh, that's why it's cool stuff found. And there's the band. I guess that means we're uh, we're out. Well, yeah. not not quite out. I hope you got him a heater. It's cold out there, man. It was cold in Nashville too. It was like really, yeah. It, it, well, I mean, the whole country's been uh, in this, you know, cold snap. Weirdo. It was, it was in like the not 30s. In California. I've, I've seen my California friends saying, "Hey, right, it's like, right, yeah." This it's this half here, of the country. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. No, it was cold down there. It was, I don't think it got much above like 50 while we were there. Mm -hmm. Normally this time of year, I think it would be like 60, mm -hmm. 65 during the day, but yeah, it got cold. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
but not below freezing because my observation has been with uh, southern states especially when you get the uh, black ice and snow it's a disaster oh yeah no 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 no. they they don't get much of that down there they do i mean they'll get maybe one snowstorm a year people were telling me but but um, they don't have the equipment to clear it for no 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 not at all no not at all Warren in the chat room suggests that I eat hot chicken. I ate Nashville hot chicken. What? That is some tasty stuff. Yeah, it is. They, it as the story, what, what, as the story goes, hot. this woman was upset that her husband was being extra flirtatious around town, and so she made him fried chicken. But she poured a lot of cayenne pepper into the batter, ah, and he loved it. And it turns out so did everybody else. So now hot chicken has become this Nashville thing, and there's lots of restaurants that serve it. And it is, it's good. I mean, it's it's like it's like fried chicken with a dry rub of cayenne. Is is kind of the way I okay. would describe it. Yeah, so I good. think that's pretty much a staple. I've I've been known, at least to myself, to make buffalo chicken wings, and cayenne pepper is a staple of that recipe. This is like buffalo wings and fried chicken had a baby. <laughs> Is kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of, but it's not like a, a, it's not a wet thing like you would get with buffalo wings. It's, it's, it's right, a, right. you know, it's like a fried chicken thing, but with that heat. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. All right. Uh, thank you for listening, folks. Thank you for submitting all your questions, all of that good stuff. We have some reviews to read, but I didn't want to, uh, we, we're running out of time. So I will read them the next time, but. Submit your reviews. Uh, go to MacGeekUp.com slash reviews. That'll get you as close as we can to Apple Podcasts uh, reviews engine. Just go leave us a review there. We would love it. It really, truly makes a big, big difference. Sign up for our weekly newsletter, too. Go to MacGeekUp.com. That way you'll get the show notes for every episode right delivered to your inbox with all the links that we mentioned that we were going to you know, put in there, that we actually do put in there. It's great. Uh, and we really appreciate you getting all that stuff because that way, you know, you have it. And then the show becomes that much more valuable for you. That's the whole idea. And then forward the email to your friends. Seriously, pick one friend for the email. Say, I love this episode because of X or you'll love it because of Y. Uh, it don't say Y because that'd be weird. You know, just like insert something in the variable there because we're geeks. But uh, yes, take the email and forward it to a friend. That we would really appreciate that. That would be um, fantastic. So, all right, we told you how to contact us. We asked you for to do a couple of things that help us all out. Uh, I, I I think that's uh, that's it. So thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks to our sponsors, of course, as we mentioned, NativeDeodorant.com and MacWeldon.com, where MGG gets you twenty percent off. And, of course, mac.cashfly.com. Our other sponsors, smilesoftware.com slash podcast, maxsales.com, barebones.com, eero.com slash mgg, linode.com slash mgg. Go follow that guy on Twitter. He's John F. Braun. And he's Dave Hamilton. I am. So, folks... I know I got caught because I didn't know about the duck, duck, go, bang, gee, but I got caught and I learned still, I think the general advice needs to remain the same. And, and so that is don't get caught. Made up.